The word Bronx was uh, anything for me except a place. The Bronx was a, a, a word used in the French vocabulary to say uh, that it was a mess. Uh, uh, when someone used to play loud music in the neighborhood, on, in your own room, um, uh, the mother and the, or the father used to come and say, what do you think you are, in the Bronx? It brings fire in me. I mean, if they do a show down in the Bronx or a big competition, it should be in the Bronx. This is where it started from. It's more spiritual. If you wasn't from the Bronx, man, you was just beginning somewhere else. We had the most clubs. We had the most musicians. You had to come up to the Bronx. Everybody was coming up to the Bronx. We weren't looking for a way out of the barrio or out of the Bronx. None of that. For us, it was, to some extent, spiritual. come out of that number two train and it shoots out of that tunnel, man, you walked into a whole new world, man. This is it. You're in the United States now. The Bronx is really important because once you leave the islands, whether you come from Puerto Rico or Santo Domingo or Cuba, or you go to the other island, you know, Brooklyn or Manhattan or Queens, then you arrive here, you're on the mainland. This is where everything spreads out. I look at this place and, you know, you see a, a baseball field. I've seen this block go through its entire life so cycle. I mean, I could stand right here and I can go from, like, where I lived, over there, where that green container is. My best friend Gerard O'Sullivan lived. By the right field poles, that was where the LeBron brothers lived. Over there by the tree was Connie's candy store. And I saw that go in a period of years. I moved from here. I moved. I left this place. And for a while, I felt nothing but shame about coming from here. Then that morphed into sadness. Everything you knew as a child, every visual cue from childhood was gone. It reminded me of like Psalm 137, you know, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept and remembered Zion. <laughs> you know, now this wasn't exactly Zion, but it wasn't too shabby either. Let's start this off with a little rhythm. It's one of the greatest tours in the world when you come to the Bronx. Yeah, my name is Angel Rodriguez, Cintron, Rivera, Olivera, Simón, Frepelepe, Villanueva, De La Paz. Aha. Aha. Come on, everybody. Aha. Aha. If you grew up in the 70s, you know about the South Bronx, how the whole neighborhood burned down to the ground. But a more recent generation know it as the place where hip-hop was born, rising up like a phoenix from the ashes. If you're a little bit older, you remember a time when this turf shaped the hot New York Latin music sound that came to be known as salsa. In the years following World War II, hard times in Puerto Rico drove more than a half million people from the island to New York City looking for work and decent housing. U.S. citizens since 1917, Puerto Ricans settled in East Harlem and the South Bronx. Yo, Papa, this is your field. What's up? Show me. I'm on body, baby. Practically everybody I knew in the music business, I met him in a schoolyard. Then from there, we went on. And stickball is what really got me into music. We called it the poor man's baseball. Half the kids couldn't afford gloves and equipment, so they invented the, they invented the stickball with a rubber ball, and you steal your mother's broomstick, take, take the straw out, and you had a bat. They would play stickball right on Kelly Street, and when you hit from the stickball, you were hitting towards Longwood Avenue, and the candy store was right on Longwood and Kelly Street. 
We all hung out in a candy store called the Mambo Candy Store. It was run by Eddie Palmieri's father. And we used to hang out there because they always had the best records. I was in charge of the jukebox. It was the hippest jukebox in the whole area, you know, because my brother at that time was playing with Tito Puente already. So I knew what was going on constantly through my brother, and that jukebox was happening. So from the signal games, everybody was going in there, and then with the jukebox going, and mambo was happening, and everybody was starting to be dancing. Eddie, Palmieri, Joe Quijano, Orlando Marin, they were all stickball guys, and we talked about music between stickball games. They would ask us, do you want to come to our little rehearsal at PS52? Because we're going to make a little group. So we would go to PS52. Sit back a little bit. Ooga! Hey, Ooga! What you got here? Ooga! <laughs> we're going to find you for being late. God bless you. That's a new word for it. Pull out the cheese. That's a new word for it. We rehearsed right in the auditorium. Oh, boy. Oh, no. I hardly fit in this chair right now. <laughs> <laughs> Another inch I don't fit in here. <laughs> PS52 on Kelly Street was a magnet for young musicians. Eddie Palmieri, Ray Barreto, Ray Cohen, Orlando Marin, Joe Quijano, Manny Okendo, and many others studied there or used to rehearse there. They would let us rehearse here and we would perform Friday nights in the, in the gym. This was the beginning of the era of the mambo dancing. The mambo was song, song, Cuban song, came to New York City, the Cubans in the 20s, they came to New York City with song, and what happened with song, it, it, it was New Yorkerized. It was New Yorkerized. <laughs> 1967. Oh, so, but guess huh? what we found? We found all your reports and your grades. Uh -oh. Oh. <laughs> we don't have them in order, but right. I know you didn't graduate. Right. You didn't graduate. <laughs> in those days, there was live music everywhere. No discos, no records, live music, even in the smallest bar. I used to go from one bar to the other. If they needed a guy, I would ask the band leader, oh yeah, man, you bug, I'm talking. What you talking? Yeah, sure I play, man. Play all night from 9 to 1 a.m. and leave for free. I'll tell the guy, oh, gee, thanks a lot, man. Being a young man uh, at that time, there was so many artists that were, were living in, in the Bronx. You had Tito Rodriguez living in the Bronx at that time. You had Tico Valdez being able to see them going to work. And at that time, all the orchestras, you know, had uniforms. You know, they were all in uniforms. So you would see them going to, you know, to work in uniforms and say, wow, look at that. You know, constantly seeing them and then knowing about them and hearing them on the records certainly was a stimuli for us. And we wanted to be able to play with one of these orchestras someday. One of the things that I remember vividly when I was growing up in the South Bronx is the sound of drums resonating through the canyons of the projects. The music was so much in full force. The culture was so in your face. There was no way that you could escape it, even if you wanted to. Even if you wanted to. You come from Puerto Rico, man. You come to New York City, the urban capital of the world, not just the United States. You, you want to get hip, man. You want to, like, you know, get up to speed with what's happening. You start dressing differently. You start talking differently. You start walking differently. When we were kids, like 14, 13, you know, we all had long hair then. So we used to carry hair combs, man, and like, yo, man, you know, put the hair back. So the combs were, we used to, you know, we got to get three or four guys on a car. When I was... Happy birthday. 
right when I got his car, man. Now that I'm, a, I'm an old timer, though, my car, and that was my car, I'd smack him. That's a great beat, man. So you could take the most uneducated person from the mountains of Puerto Rico, un jibara del campo, as we say. All of a sudden, he comes to New York City in the 40s, goes to the Park Palace Ballroom on 110th Street and 5th Avenue. The band that they heard was the Machito Orchestra, this incredible hip orchestra that's so sophisticated that it, even people in the jazz world, their mouths were open when they would see and hear this band. So in six months, you see that same Hiwaro del Campo walking, talking, bopping their head, and all of a sudden, they're a New York hipster. You ask me about salsa, what it was, just Cuban music with a freaking New York attitude. Maria Bautha came from Havana, and he was not a white Havana, you know, habanero, like they say, habanero. He was Afro. Dockskin. And the band that he was allowed to be in, because in those days, let's face it, all the bands were all white or, or Afro. There was no mix at all. But he wants to make a mambo band. He writes a letter home, he tells his in-law, who happened to be Machito, come to New York, we're gonna make a band. Oh! 